All right. We are live. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you, Thank you for joining Hello. us today. Um, my name is Ed Underberg, and I will be your MC for uh, the balance of the morning. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, give it a minute or two as uh, I can see the uh, individuals uh, logging in. Um, and uh, as we get started, we can go around um, and do a little bit of introductions uh, here in a moment. But uh, bear with us for 30, 60 seconds as we get started. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. This will give me a chance to real quick check a housekeeping thing. So one moment. All right, uh, the guests are starting to fill in. Um, so uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, begin. Um, as I stated, uh, my name is Ed Underberg um, and I will be your moderator. Um, and since everyone here is a, is a marketer, um, you all know the, the power of frequency. Uh, and that being said, uh, I would like to frequently remind you uh, that you may ask questions in the chat box um, and I'll feed them uh, to our panelists. Um, so uh, today is your chance to uh, ask away in terms of uh, questions that you're curious about around marketing automation. Uh, quickly about myself, um, I work as Xeris's marketing technology account executive and I love helping clients solve marketing challenges. Um, Enough about me. Uh, we have an exciting panel of speakers that I cannot wait to tell you more about. So without further ado, let me introduce you to them, uh, beginning with Allison Conley uh, from Adobe Marketo. Uh, Allison is a results-driven sales professional at Adobe, specializing in Marketo and Visible, uh, the Adobe Experience Cloud as well. During her three and a half years with the company, Allison has helped dozens of marketing teams with digital transformation, better understanding and crafting superior customer experiences, as well as becoming data-driven marketers. Uh, she works with multiple verticals, including high tech, healthcare and finance, of which I believe we have all the three of those represented today, and is responsible for the holistic management of client relationships across Adobe's growth organization. Allison also holds a BA from Vanderbilt University and where she developed a love for all things marketing during her time there. All right, moving on, uh, Devin Norvell uh, from Vertify. Hello, Devin. Hello. Uh, Devin is the channel manager for Vertify, uh, director of channel development uh, with six years in the, in the SaaS sales space. Uh, we do want to make sure that we're communicating in, in, uh, the, uh, in, in simplest terms. So SaaS, of course, means software as a service uh, for those of you that are new to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, idea. Um, and Devin specializes in taking a consultative sales approach uh, in solving problems uh, and is now help focused on sales and marketing teams, uh, helping sales and marketing teams get the most out of their data. Uh, lastly, uh, our third panelist is Brandon Schulte, the Director of Marketing Technology for Xeris. Uh, Brandon is a marketing technology expert. Uh, Brandon has more than 15 years of experience in the space and understands the challenges faced by marketing uh, and sales leaders to grow revenue while optimizing channel efficiency, external speed, and employee productivity. As a results-focused professional, Brandon is known for growing highly scalable sales pipelines and e-commerce revenue, utilizing technology solutions, process enhancement, and customer analytics. In addition, Brandon holds an MBA degree from Northern Illinois University and teaches strategic leadership at, in the Concordia University MBA program. And uh, without further ado, let's get into the questions. Uh, and to kick things off, uh, we have a question that we'll pose to all of our panel participants today. Um, and I think that I'll pick on Allison first. Allison, uh, why don't you share with us, uh, what's the best thing about being a marketing technology professional? 
Oh gosh, I don't think I can answer that in, in 60 seconds, Ed. Um, I feel very lucky because I absolutely love what I do. I love marketing. I love working with marketers. And I think what I enjoy most is that um, there's just constant innovation in our industry. Um, there's always a new strategy, a new tool, um, a, a new company. There's always something new. And that's really thrilling to me. And, you know, not to sound too um, salesy, but I truly do believe that, you know, marketing and, you know, customer experiences drive the majority of every business we interact with. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Allison. Devin, how about you? Well, I really love helping marketers make the most of their data. So I find my clients typically have a treasure trove of behavioral information and helping them use that to the fullest is exciting. I really loved working with this space. And just like Allison was saying, I think the MarTech space has a lot of innovation and I'm always interested in hearing what people are doing and what new products are out there. Fantastic. And uh, Brandon, let's round it out with you. Well, thanks, Ed. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel today. And, and we, we are wearing the team uniform, I guess, today. So <laughs> we didn't yes. coordinate that and plan that. Um, it's also great to be with Devin and, and Allison as well, two people that we definitely work with frequently and respect in the industry. Um, and, and then also to you, the viewer, we really appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy schedules to listen to our information today. If I had to use one word to describe this, I would say impact. And that's really something that we try to focus on with each and every client. I know that's near and dear to um, both Devin and Allison's hearts as well. Um, at Xerus, our marketing technology mission statement is we want to help companies increase customer engagement and conversions by unifying customer data and acting on it real time. And I can't think of a better, better platform that does that than marketing automation. So whether it's looking to uncover that hidden demand within your customer base, whether that's looking to attribute your revenue to spend, whether that's trying to scale your communications across channel or optimize the effectiveness of your marketing team. We get to help companies do that every day. And that's really rewarding as a marketing technology professional. Well, thank you very much, Brandon. Um, now moving on to the uh, heart of the questions for, for today's session. Uh, Allison, let's begin with you. Uh, it seems like few roles within an organization have changed as much as the marketer um, with more channels, greater customer expectations, and increasing advertising costs. How can a technology like marketing automation enable us to combat these challenges? Yeah, and I think, I mean, even with the, the current atmosphere in the past two years, like this is more true than ever, more channels, more and greater customer expectations. Um, I think marketing automation at its core, it's, you know, it's really meant to help scale and create processes and customer experiences that otherwise would be impossible to manage without it. Um, so because tools like Marketo um, or similar automation tools help align companies, align processes, um, marketers really are more able to focus on the customer. Um, in general, it creates more operational efficiency. So there's less reliance on IT, less reliance on SOPs and operations. So each of these departments, um, even if they're not touching a marketing automation tool, they're able to focus on what's critical and, and important to them for success. Um, and with so many more channels, web ads, TikTok, anything you can imagine. Um, marketing automation just helps you uh, scale over these channels, automate processes over these channels. And I think really um, enables just every modern marketing practice that, that you can imagine. Thanks, Allison. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of, of our session, uh, I want this to be interactive. So uh, this would be a good time for us to jump in and I'm gonna introduce a poll um, so uh, all of our uh, registrants and, and attendees today may uh, participate. Uh, I'm going to hit the button to publish that. So uh, feel free to uh, answer that question. And then we can even, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, tailor a little bit of our conversation today around some of those uh, answers that you would provide. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll check back on that in, in a second. Um, let's move on to Devin. Devin. Hey, how are you? Doing well, how are you? I'm great. We hear all the time how difficult it is for marketers to get the right data attributes mm -hmm. uh, on their customers and prospects 
to harness in campaigns, the concept of rich first party data, right? That uh, so many organizations want and need uh, to be successful. Uh, can you tell us how Vertify helps solve this problem? Yeah, so first I'll explain a little bit about what a Vertify does. We are an integration platform that specializes in helping tell the story between marketing automation platforms and CRMs. So Vertify in particular opens up a ton of really nuanced campaign segmentation by being able to trigger off any field on a contact. So us being hooked into that marketing automation system in the CRM is going to give marketers more to work with with the existing data than you may think. Like you have a treasure trove in there that I think we can help you better utilize. So we can also sync off of trigger rec or we can trigger off of custom objects. And as you gather more targeted data from using a system like Marketo with the really advanced analytics and reporting, we can do even more specialized campaign triggers and customer segmentation. So getting that data from a good marketing automation tool is paramount. And then making sure your sales and marketing teams can use it to its fullest is going to be the next step that I think any marketer would want to take right now. Fantastic answer. And I uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, Moving along, I, I got one for you here, Brandon. Uh, according to a recent Accenture survey, 90% of organizations view marketing as the connective tissue between different lines of business, that being sales, technology, service, and product, based on its ownership of customer data and insights. Can you talk to us and to the and to our guests today about you what you've seen uh, how you've seen marketing automation facilitate this type of growth? Yeah, that's a great question and something that I hear all the time, um, especially when a company is investing in a tool like marketing automation. How am I able to get the ROI and show value for this? And to kind of get to the end of the to answer the question, I want to kind of talk about you know, kind of where we start and, and understand. You know why companies need marketing automation and, and allison really hit this in her question a little bit ago but as she said there's more channels than ever before there's increased customer expectation it's a more competitive landscape where, where customers expect us to do more um and and, and companies are, are fighting harder over those dollars from from potential customers and prospects at the same time you're seeing increased ad costs and then um uh, distribution of, amongst all these different channels. So it's tough to you know what is doing more. Or do you need to invest more in different things? And what marketing automation really does to me is bring up that all together. So because you're able to take information, not just email specifically, but you're able to take things in from social channels, from web channels, from um, organic channels, from content marketing channels into one funnel and understand what customers are doing and engaging, whether that's on your website, whether that's with emails, whether that's with webinars or any of, of the other myriad of things, whether with your sales team um, within CRM, you know, and really being able to engage those customers across the different channels with the right message. So depending on where the customer is um, in their customer journey, you're able to really orchestrate that journey. Uh, so if somebody is a prospect, you can send them the right information there. If somebody's a marketing qualified lead, you can send them the right information at that stage of their journey. If somebody is a newly onboarded customer that just um, you know, closed, they're more excited about your product than ever. Like what type of messages do you have to them to start them off on the right foot? You also have the ability to personalize at scale. So when we're looking at companies like maybe you, you, you use, utilize ABM, and you have certain cu customers that you're really targeting, the message to them may be different uh, than maybe someone who you know isn't one of your your target key accounts. Um, and the ability to to target um, have marketing communications that make sense to sales is really important. Um, secondarily, you're also able to based on industry role, different things like that. There's a lot of buyers in most uh, journeys, so understanding how you communicate to a, a champion versus someone who's the the buyer versus who is um, you know maybe the procurement person is really important to understand why this is the right product. And then lastly, being able to improve, uh, prove their impact of the organization. Uh, marketers have struggled with this for years to be able to say we're investing significant dollars, both in technology, but also in ad, uh, ad platforms and, and advertisements and, and creative. So how can I understand what is impacting my customer, what's moving them down the funnel, and what ultimately capitalizing to a sale so I can create, do more of what's working and less of what isn't. Yeah, no, that's a, a very comprehensive answer. I appreciate that, Brandon. It it ties into the results of our uh, recent poll that we just that we just executed. Um, when you had mentioned personalization, um, 
the uh, the results of the poll for everybody out there. I don't know if you can see it exactly the way that I can or not, but 36% was the, the highest response for uh, the answer, and that was dynamic content and personalization, followed by privacy and compliance concerns. Um, and as a marketer, geez, you know, I, privacy and compliance are really important. Um, they're they're uh, they're not as as exciting and fun as dynamic content and personalization, though. So I'm kind of surprised to see how high it is up there. Um, but that's a a, a good indicator of uh, what you guys are thinking and concerned about. Followed by integration with CRM, um, and then lead nurturing and lead scoring, uh, bringing in the rear. So. Um, anyways, let's uh, make sure that we speak to some of these topics today, guys, uh, particularly dynamic content and personalization, since we're uh, learning that that's what our attendees are most interested in. Thank you. And uh, moving on, uh, back to you, Allison. Uh, recently, I read a survey uh, of chief marketing officers uh, that were shocked to learn that CMOs said that about only 40% of the time they rely on data to make decisions. Um, with so much data available today, how can that even be possible? And what recommendations uh, do you have, Allison, for marketers who they just wanna incorporate camp campaign results into their decision-making process? What's that look like? And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so it's, it's very, very difficult to access accurate data um, for a number of reasons. So one, like we saw in the poll, just general privacy and compliance concerns. Um, are you following GT GDPR compliance? Are you even aware of what this new Apple iOS you know, compliance is, looks like, how it impacts your marketing stack and your marketing strategies? So you know, for a number of reasons, it's hard to access the data. Um, typically, there are a lot of data silos in someone's tech stack. So data systems aren't speaking together. Um, maybe your team isn't working with a Vertify and Devon or a similar organization. Um, and if you do have reporting and attribution tools in place, there's typically a lot of limitations on what you can see and like actually being able to go through the entire customer um, So, and I think there's a little bit of feedback. I'm not sure if y'all are hearing that. I took care of that. That looks okay. like a house, housekeeping thing that I was able to solve just now. No problem. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so it's difficult to get the data. And I think that, you know, recommendations, I could talk about this all day. Um, first, teams, I think, should start to develop KPIs that matter. So views, click-through rates, MQLs versus SQLs, those are very important and necessary. Um, but I think when you think beyond that and you start to think of, what does it look like to measure pipeline? What does it look like to measure revenue and actually be able to report that to your C-suite and executives? Um, that can change a lot with how you view and understand data. Um, if you are not familiar with Visible, that's one of uh, Adobe's premier attribution tools. So I think familiarizing yourself with different multi-touch attribution capabilities is very important and understanding just the overall financial value of investing in attribution software is important. Um, so I don't know if this is pinned on the channel, but recently uh, Adobe commissioned Forrester to perform a total economic impact of Visible. Um, so they looked at five different Visible customers from US-based customers under 50 million revenue all the way to global enterprise customers. Um, and they found that with the investment of Visible, companies were seeing almost a 4X return on investment, um, wow. payback periods less than a year, huge increase in qualified leads and incremental pipeline. So I won't go too much into that. Um, I'll try to link the, the PDF for that uh, study, but just my biggest recommendation is start to understand um, how valuable an attribution tool could be for your organization. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we have a question uh, coming up a little bit later on, Allison, about leads specific, specifically. So we'll get more into that. I wanted to just make sure that all of our attendees were on board with what an SQL and an MQL is. And uh, that's a, a marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead. And we'll get more into that on that follow-up question on down the line. So thank you so much, Allison. A great answer. 
Uh, Devin, for you, um, a study uh, by Forbes Insights found that only 13% of companies are leaders in leveraging customer data. Mm -hmm. uh, According uh, or additionally, 89% uh, of executives surveyed see a moderate to high risk level of digital disruption likely to occur in the next three years. So how can companies turn this digital disruption into a competitive advantage? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think digital disruption is a good thing for us and a good thing for marketers because the more ways your prospects are engaging digitally, the better. And that's going to help with these personalization concerns that our attendees are having. The more channels you have to figure out how your customers are behaving, the more you're going to be able to better personalize the messaging to them. So being adap adaptable to change is always going to net you a competitive advantage. And you can use these disruptions to gain more insights into how prospects are interacting with your brand and similar brands to inspire you to have new ways to engage with them, new channels for engagement. Awesome. Uh, one thing that I've heard kind of relative to that question is that companies that embrace uh, a first party data strategy uh, mm -hmm. are gonna have the competitive advantage in the next decade. Um, data being one of the you know certain uh, opportunities for organizations to grow and stand out relative to their competition. Right now would be a good time to uh, hop in and just say, don't forget, if you do have a question that is a, and you have a burning desire to hear about, uh, don't forget you can chat that to us. Um, and a couple other housekeeping things, uh, we wanted to make sure to provide some resources uh, uh, for our attendees today. So we have some files that we've shared. Um, so please review those. And if you have any questions about them, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Last but not least, on the um, the Xeris, uh, marketing workshop with Marketo. Um, we'd like to uh, extend an offer to all of our attendees today. It's a typical uh, $999 cost for the workshop event, um, but we're waiving that for any of our uh, attendees. So uh, you may ignore or cross out the $999 on that if you'd be interested in taking us up on it. Uh, back to the business at hand, Brandon. Uh, the, dis the disconnection between companies and customers has never been greater when it comes to privacy regulations. So get into one of those poll questions here. While nearly all customers and policymakers rate data privacy as a concern, many businesses see the privacy laws as burdens that, restric that restrict growth. Um, how, does, how should marketers help balance these considerations uh, so that you're still able to get the value out of what you're trying to accomplish but being within the laws and policies and regulations that you need to be? This is a great question that I get all the time from people at, especially the last four or five years with things like GDPR, CASEL, CCPA. I know there's a few other laws going into effect uh, in the near term. I believe Virginia just passed one. I think maybe they've added it as well. So lots of different um, you know, things out there to be aware of. Um, and, and while these laws vary from country to country and state to state, um, there's a few things that generally that they're looking for. Um, the first thing is that you should only receive marketing communications where there's an express consent from the customer. So that means like tracking opt-in that you'll see on some forms. Um, also, they, they need to, companies need to clearly define how the personal, personal information from customers is being collected, used, and shared. Um, they also want to give customers the right to opt out of the sale of personal information or to the right to opt out of receiving communications in the future. And some laws like GDPR, which is probably the most restrictive, um, the, you, the customer can uh, request their data to be removed from all your systems upon request, and you have to comply with that. Um, there's very significant penalties for this that range from you know tens of thousands of dollars to uh, millions of dollars um, in, in some that also hold your board of directors personally liable for infractions. So it's it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, so a lot of marketers, like you said in your question, you know, kind of look at these as burdensome. And I, I looked at those that way for a while. However, um, I recently saw a, a, a podcast um, that kind of talked about the importance of um, 
creating that trust with customers or building that trust. And the way I look at it is how do you turn compliance women's into lemonade, um, you know, to use an, an old saying there. Um, but uh, the recent study that I'm referring to, 81% of customers directly correlate trusting a brand with making a purchase from that company. So when I look at compliance, I look at, okay, what can we do to demonstrate our trust trustworthiness to a customer? Um, and that means, you know, obviously, yeah, uh, opting them in to receive things because when they when we do that, they're more likely to engage with our content because we're sending them what we what they want. We're also not sending them junk that disconnects them from our brand and and causes them to you know look elsewhere from what they're doing. Um, also, the fact that we're clearly stating what our security and data practices are up front, you know, makes customers feel comfortable that they can trust us not only with their data and with the sales process, but potentially when they become a customer, that they can trust our brand to do the right thing for them. Um, also, the ability to offer users the ability to subscribe and unsubscribe from different materials. You know, while you know maybe you have a few less people to send because people unsubscribe, you're going to have much more engagement because they're interested in, in, in doing that and and they're going to want to receive that material. So. You know, if you shift it from, you know, how can I market to the most people that how can I market to the right people at the right time and provide that right connection? I think compliance will take care of itself um, by doing the right things marketing wise. Sure. Uh, fantastic answer. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Allison, uh, a report, uh, a recent report estimated that U.S. organizations lost three quarters of a trillion dollars per year uh, with over 40 percent of consumers switching companies due to poor personalization and lack of trust. So kind of speaking to Brandon's trust uh, comments there, how can automated customer journeys increase retention while also driving net new business? Yeah, so there's there's a lot that goes into a customer journey that I think gets overlooked. Um, so, you know, what is someone's experience on your website, across your ads, on a landing page for an event? Um, you know, once someone's expressed interest, what happens after that? Like, how often are you reaching out to them? Is it a cadence? Is it based off behavior? When do you loop in your sales rep? How do you measure success? Like, there's there's so much that goes into a customer journey. And when we think about automating that, a lot of things get overlooked because the, sometimes the tools just aren't there. So if I think about Marketo specifically, there is a lot that... Uh, that makes marketing teams more productive and efficient because of the automation itself. So within Marketo, we have dynamic content. So that means we're able to personalize your emails, who they're from, um, like different pictures, different content blocks. Um, and we can even add an AI layer powered by Adobe Sensei. Um, so we're actually recommending specific content through AI that is, you know, shown to lead to more engagement and conversions. Um, within Marketo, that extends that dynamic content that extends to our forms, landing pages. Um, so a lot of that is automated. We have some amazing cloning capabilities. So you're not having to recreate the wheel every single time, whether it's for an email or an entire, you know, whatever you want to call it, nurture or engagement program. Um, so there's a lot of tools in place with a, you know, with a robust marketing automation tool um, that can help when we think about customer retention. So are we uh -huh. keeping top of mind with your current customers? Are your current customers receiving the kind of offers, content, um, campaigns that are most relevant to them? Um, there's a lot that we can do in terms of just net new business and net new customers as well. So are we personalizing your website? Are we retargeting across your ad network? in a way that is speaking directly to that specific segment mm -hmm. um, so that we are showing them what they are most interested in. Um, and I think a lot of that comes back to just your data itself. So because we have open APIs, because we have hundreds of native partnerships with you know, best in breed software providers, um, we really, Marketo is able to work across your entire tech stack. So there are so many things you can do when it comes to personalization. Um, that, you know, I don't have time to cover all of it today, but there's there's a lot that can be done. Um, and I think that, you know, if retention specifically is a key objective for your organization, um, having a conversation with Marketo is, is definitely valuable. 
Fantastic. Um, considering uh, dynamic content and personalization uh, led the way in our uh, poll of attendees is most interested topics today. I wanted to give Brandon and Devin a chance to kind of uh, double click into uh, that conversation as well. Um, and just maybe you got some other thoughts on uh, the benefits and uh, some of the strategies around uh, personalization and what that might look like. Yeah, I can answer that from a technical perspective. So if you have a solid integration tool like Avertify connecting into a solid marketing automation tool like Marketo, you're going to exponentially increase your ability to personalize those emails because you will be able to pull all of the contact data from your contact records from the people you know have either purchased your software, purchased your product, or potentially just maybe need an extra step of follow-up or it wasn't the right time for them. You're going to have access to all of that information for marketing back to them. So when we talk about increasing personalization and building this dynamic content, that full customer journey and full picture of how the customer has interacted with your brand is paramount. And then you also need a partner in a complex and robust tool in your marketing automation stack that can take that information and do something great with it. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Brandon, would, would you be able to speak to that? And um, and if possible, not to put you on the spot, but maybe speak to it a little bit from a, a B2B standpoint. We so often think about marketing from B2C, um, but I see so many of our attendees uh, would be interested in that B2B perspective as well. Sure. Yeah. No, when I think of personalization, I look at it uh, through a couple different lenses. So First and foremost, am I presenting the right information to the right it's the right customer at the right time in the way that it makes them, um, you know, engage with my content? So, you know, a lot of times when I come into uh, when a customer is coming into your site, it may be via email channel, it may be via um, a paid search channel, maybe via something else. So, being able to customize that content to them in a way that is relevant to them, I think it makes a lot of sense. So if I'm an in industry X, I'm gonna want information on industry X, not industry Y. So being able to understand that, I think is really important. The other thing that personalization really helps you do is, you know, like I said earlier, building that trust with the customer. You know me, you know what's relevant to me, you're sending me content that resonates with me, so I stay engaged, which is really important. Um, the worst thing that you can do is either be over generalized or I have seen some companies that have tried personalization but haven't executed with a product that's as good as say a Marketo where maybe it says, you know, hi, first name instead of their name or, or they, they, you have something incorrect there. One of the nice things about a, a platform like Marketo is you're able to personalize when it makes sense or you're able to use default content that mm -hmm. says maybe hi, friend, hi, whoever. So it still is personalized to them. But um, if you don't have that data, you're not going to uh, have something silly in there. So I think that's a really nice thing to do just to make sure you're doing personalization right. And then the last piece really comes down from, you know, kind of that testing what works and what doesn't. So whether that's testing within emails, A-B testing, or A-B testing on a web page, understanding within a customer journey what ultimately converts customers better. And by trying multiple things out and using you know, define processes of what you're going to test, how you're going to test it, where you're going to see the results. That's ultimately going to make your marketing be more effective and a better experience for customers. Excellent. Excellent. We have our first uh, uh, question from one of our attendees. Um, and it's a it's a fantastic question. I'll, I'll take a stab at answering and then invite the team to uh, answer as well. Uh, the question is, how can a marketer prepare for marketing automation? What are some specific things marketers should know when speaking to business development teams and executives to convince them that marketing automation is a worthwhile tool for the company? Uh, so, uh, you know, just from uh, our perspective at Xerus, we spend a lot of time uh, working with uh, potential clients and potential customers um, and educating them on the merits and value of what marketing automation can do for an organization. Uh, we have a lot of resources and uh, uh, documents, collateral, if you will, uh, to help support that sales enablement, which is what we call that. Um, and somebody else that I'm sure is uh, knee deep in that on a daily basis is going to be Allison. So I'm going to direct this question to you, Allison, if you don't mind. Um, what are some of the tips you could provide for the attendees that might be on the, the cusp of considering marketing automation tools and, um, 
and selling up into an organization to uh, uh, accomplish uh, that? Yeah, so I think a, a lot of it starts with, I. so a lot of problems um, that marketing teams face, whether it's, you know, you need to do more with less or you, you know, you want to create more marketing leads for sales or maybe your leads aren't qualified. Whatever it is, a lot of the problems that I typically speak with people about, um, they're really more organizational problems, but marketing has taken the brunt of the challenge. So I think that if you're able to identify solid problems within, you know, not just marketing, but the organization as a whole, um, and you're able to say, you know, a tool like Marketo or a tool, some kind of marketing automation tool could actually help with this um, and show, you know, whether you are creating a business case or whether you work with Marketo, we actually have a value consulting team that helps create, like their only job is to create business cases and ROI analysis of Marketo. Um, so they're really able to help paint the picture and iterate how something like our system is able to you know, solve a lot of the problems you may be facing, whether it's, hey, Marketo is going to help reduce reliance on IT. So now IT can fo focus on our product roadmap or Marketo is going to save, you know, hours of your time, of your team's time, because we're able to clone, automate, do a lot of the things that's taking you, uh, that's either manual or taking way more time than needed. Um, I think it's just identifying the problems and then tying it back to, how our tool could help. And we have resources um, that can help you create that case. Yeah, you use the word case a handful of times in your explanation, Allison. And, and, no, and, and it made me think, it made me think of uh, case studies and um, some of those resources that uh, I know that, uh, that we have and we share with, with you as a, as a Marketo and Adobe partner um, and being able sometimes to provide some of that, what I would call social proof um, that, hey, let's say that you're a, you know, a, a construction firm. Um, let's take a look at what other uh, construction and design firms have done, or you're in the financial sector. What are some of the financial organizations that have utilized a tool like a Marketo, for example, to be successful? Um, and uh, I would uh, encourage and invite any of you that have questions about that just to uh, chat me. You can do it on the side or um, we'll provide our contact information at the, at the conclusion of our program today. Um, and I can assist with uh, that sales enablement piece. So a great question from one of our attendees. Thank you so much. And now back to the regularly scheduled program. Uh, Devin, uh, a recent survey conducted by Okta estimated that the average large business used more than 120 applications. That's a lot of applications. Uh, while the average small to mid-sized business used over 70 applications. Okay, so while a portion of these tools, uh, you know, just a small portion of them are gonna be used for marketing, uh, what would you do or how would you advise a company to create uh, synergy uh, in their technical stack to make sure that, um, you know, they're uh, incorporating IT, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of my favorite things to solve for clients. I love getting to look at that entire tech ecosystem and figure out where the silos exist, where the information that could be making such a difference in the marketing exists and pulling that all into a centralized tech ecosystem where all of these tools are speaking to each other. So I would say out of all the tools in your stack, or a marketer, anything that has behavioral data for a customer needs to be integrated with your CRM and your marketing automation tool. Because you want any and all information with how they're interacting with your brand so that you can better map the buyer journey, you can invest your spend more wisely. I would investigate probably plugins for smaller tools, just mm -hmm. speaking as a person who works with a lot of integrations. You don't necessarily need a robust integration solution for every tool, but you can use plugins to hook into something like a Marketo or another marketing automation tool that might have a very open system and can connect in easily. But then look at an integration project or product for more robust data handling. So kind of these use cases we've been discussing around marketing automation in the CRM, that's going to need an extra layer of sophistication, but 
using different integration tools at different sizes for the different needs in each of these platforms that you're connecting in will provide that full data picture, give you the buyer journey, and tell you where your spend is making you the most money. That makes a lot of sense. It, uh, some color on that from the Xerus perspective. We we often talk about um, you need the changes, you need to enable change in people, processes, and technology. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can't just roll out a, 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 a really sophisticated and awesome tool like a Marketo and not talk about the processes and people part of that. Um, so we, we really strive to, as a part of our uh, partnering with clients and standing up tools to uh, not only uh, get the, the marketing executives involved in their buy-in, um, but to work with across different uh, departments, for example, IT. Uh, we, need, we need IT's partnership. We need IT's buy-in in order to enable change across an organization. So uh, just a, a, a tidbit of our experience there. Uh, Brandon, question for you. Uh, with the proliferation of software as a service, uh, SaaS uh, applications for marketing, CMO technology spend uh, has already surpassed that of CIO in many firms. So chief marketing officer versus chief information officer, uh, according to Gartner. Uh, furthermore, pr the priorities, constraints, and missions of IT teams and marketing teams can be very different. So uh, kind of speaking to what I was just discussing, as someone who sits between marketing and technology at that intersection, how should marketers foster a good working relationships uh, relationship with their counterparts in IT? Yeah, well, certainly sometimes the relationship between IT and marketing can be of that of an odd couple. Um, not, having lived on both sides of the equation, I can definitely understand that. So not, not to date myself too much, but when I think about the IT marketing relationship and some of the issues that can arise, I, I think about a book from about 30 years ago titled Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, ah. which I think was like the highest selling book of the 1990s. Um, in that book, the author kind of talks about how men and women communicate differently and how important it is to maintain the lines of communication and really understand the perspective of the other party in the relationship. And I think that's really important when it comes to IT and marketing. Um, you know, obviously communication is the key, having regular meetings, um, understanding, looking at things from their perspective, walking a mile in their shoes, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. But a few other things that I've found that can be really helpful to really help foster that relationship is to number one, define who owns each technology within your marketing technology stack. So sometimes it might be marketing, sometimes it may be IT, sometimes it may be shared and really understanding who owns what because that dictates kind of how it's managed from a, a not only adding additional features or upgrading things, but also from a support perspective and using it day in and day out. Um, I also think it's really important and really successful when companies embed technology professionals within their marketing organization. So sometimes the, I've seen companies do it like as a service model or it's very siloed on both sides. Um, but when you put technologists within your marketing team, A, it empowers your marketing team to do more, but B, they also understand what you're trying to do from a marketing perspective while not getting the, having the marketing team get the organization in trouble because they're trying to off, go off and do their own thing without making sure it's within their IT infrastructure. Lastly, I think it's really important to align the success metrics for both teams and for everyone involved um, within the, the platform, whether it be in, in I, marketing or in, in IT, because regardless of the department, at the end of the day, companies are successful when they grow revenue, they do the right things by their customers, they're maintaining compliance like we talked about earlier. So if there is skin in the game for everybody involved, they're gonna work towards a common goal which is normally going to make your, your organization more successful overall because everybody's kind of singing from that same same sheet of music. That makes sense. Uh, great answer, Brandon. Thank you. Allison, uh, here's something everybody uh, today can, can appreciate. Uh, how has the pandemic changed the ways uh, companies think and consume technology? I have not heard this question before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean... Everything has changed, right? Our, our relationship with brands has changed. Our relationship with how we think about and consume technology has changed. I think, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, um, some of the biggest things that has changed, at least from what I'm hearing, what the conversations I have with my prospects and customers. Um, so 
one common thing, like the line between B to B and B to C is slowly disappearing. So like typically B to C is very hyper segmented, hyper personalized. Um, that is becoming the case for B to B marketing teams as well. Um, so a lot of B to B organizations want that same level of personalization and you know how you speak to your different segments in B2B is just as important as how you speak to segments in B2C. So I think that that's one change I hear a lot. Um, and then also, if we're thinking about just changes within organizations themselves, um, budget cuts, you know, fewer resources, it's really important to adopt technology that is agile. Um, so, you know, something that's easy to use. Like we all say we're easy to use. There are a lot of nuances with ease of use, um, but something that's easy to use, something that is trusted um, because the rate in which we make decisions has drastically changed. Um, the rate in which people expect their experiences with your brand and with your company um, has rapidly changed. So having a tool like Marketo or, you know, a similar tool um, that's really gonna be agile and you know be easy to train your team on, um, easily mold throughout your organization and your digital stack is super important. Absolutely, absolutely. I I really like the concept of uh, maybe uh, double clicking a little bit on the the B two B and the B two C component of things. And um, so I'll speak to it quickly and then throw it out to the team, uh, kind of calling a quick audible. Um, one of the things that I've found that I really appreciate about marketing automation is its ability uh, for the for both B two B and B two C. But you know, really thinking and putting on that B two B cap right now, um, in terms of being able to uh, speed up what I call the the sales velocity. Um, so if uh, if your average deal to close from a first touch to new customer is six months, or we have some customers in the design and architecture space that could be upwards of three years, right? So um, what are you doing in between six months and three years uh, to uh, make sure that you're touching and, and nurturing that lead? Um, just imagine how many, how much time goes by in between, you know, prospect to close. Um, and then, also, you know, if if it wasn't at scale, if if you only had a handful of customers, or if you could count them all on one hand, it wouldn't be difficult to say, okay, well, I need to email Jim, and and here here's where Jim is at in the sales cycle, and oh, I remember Sarah's over here, and she's in the sales cycle at this stage, uh, but when you start scaling it, so you've got, you know, maybe you're in the car industry and and your sales cycle maybe is even a little bit faster, like two two weeks long, and and you've got 75 customers that you are trying to provide the right message at the right time um, to drive an action that you want to see. Uh, what's that look like, and uh, and how how does marketing automation assist with that? Um, and so I'll just uh, you know zip it and kind of turn it back over to you guys if anybody has any color they want to share on that. Otherwise, we can pop back into the regular questions, but I thought that might be a good pop in for us. Perfect, we can just keep going. Um, let's see, I've got a question for you, Devin. Devin, um, we've discussed how technology can be an accelerant in the demand gen process. Yeah. As your product is one of the key ingredients to successfully rolling out new technology, how have you seen that people and processes need to change in order to successfully roll out MarTech, marketing technology uh, initiatives within an organization? Yeah, I would say uh, my clients need a good understanding of their data or to Phrase it another way, my clients who have a very good understanding of their data are more successful in implementation and advanced marketing automation. Because when you really understand what you have, you can form better ideas about how to use it. So you need a firm grasp on what data you want to capture if it's not already existing in the marketing automation tool you use or the CRM. 
And you also need to think about how you want to disseminate that information to other platforms in the stack. So how you want the data to move is going to make a huge difference in your ability to personalize because you're going to be able to send any of that back to the marketing tool, but what you send and how you send it is going to play a large role in how successful that automation is. Excellent. I, the way that I think of it is it's just kind of like you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if you fall down and if you fall down because you can't capture this field, this specific important nugget of information to incorporate into your marketing message, then you're missing an opportunity. So um, I really appreciate the Vertify data tools that you guys offer. Uh, they assist in, in being able to accomplish that. Um, when there's not a native integration to be able to do so. So thank you so much, Devin. Yeah, and Devin, I, I liked what you said because I feel like just the topic of data itself and like the importance of data to a marketing automation tool and to marketing teams in general, we, we don't talk about it enough. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite solutions architects at Adobe, like no matter what the use case is, the very first thing they always ask me is, what is the data source? Everything's about the data. Yeah. Um, so when we think about like marketing qualified leads, what makes a good MQL? How can marketing generate more leads so, you know, salespeople can have as many leads as possible and be happy? Um, it all stems back to the data. So having that data source, having a good integration with your, you know, especially with your CRM or whatever your, your data source of truth and your marketing system of truth is so crucial to marketing qualified leads. Um, it helps maintain sales alignment. Um, it helps like during the entire lead generation, demand generation process. And it really, you know, if I think about like, I get asked a lot about just how can we increase our leads? Um, you know, how can we provide more to sales in addition to some of the tools like Marketo offers like sales insights, mm -hmm. which does show your sales reps, interesting moments, past activities, lead score changes. Um, the biggest thing is to make sure you're starting with clean data um, because that's going to help with all of the personalization and all of the segmentation that is necessary um, to drive a good quality lead. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I, I'm noticing we're about at the... Oh, go ahead, Devin. I apologize. Oh, I was just saying I could not have said it better. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree too. They, they both hit on a great point. So... You know, if I was going to have an analogy, and, and we use this in some of the marketing materials, uh, especially with Zeros and Vertify working together, but your marketing automation system, that's your spaceship. Mm -hmm. the, the data is your fuel that allows you to get to point A to point B. And then your consultant, that's where they come in. They're the pilot that helps get you where you want to go to make sure that you're, you're using that most effectively. So that's kind of how I look at our, as our partnership, the three of us together to help mm -hmm. make companies successful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we have got about an eight minute warning. I'm going to put it out there. So I'm going to cherry pick a few of these questions. And Brandon, you spoke to this just a little bit ago. Um, why should organizations consider an IT services partner when it comes to uh, architecting, implementing, implementing and managing technology? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I, I think back to when I started my career in technology. So I, I started as an operation of operations professional running a team there um, quickly moved into marketing um, and then over to technology from there and I remember the first architect I worked with like um, using technology where it was the preponderance of what I did for my job and I remember him telling me that 50% of the technology our team creates is going to be thrown away and as somebody from a from a marketing or from a operations background that was just horrifying to think that like half of what our technology team is going to do is is not going to be of, of use um, so, so that's one point there. And then that same architect uh, also imparted another piece of wisdom to me. Um, he kind of channeled his inner Donald Rumsfeld to bring a you know, mm -hmm. blast from the past there. But, you know, it, he said something about, you know, there are known, known knowns and unknown unknowns or something to that effect. And, you know, he, he told me that, you know, if we knew what we, we knew six months ago, what we know today, we would have we would have architected that very differently. And that's where consultants really come in, into play because we're we're working in platforms all day, every day, like marketing automation platforms, like integration platforms, um, other technologies like CRM, maybe ad tech platforms, things like that. 
you know, that's where consultants are worth their weight in gold because in a lot of cases, you know, we're not necessarily smarter than your team. Your team with given time and, and resources could figure out all the tools that we talk about, right? But what we bring is that wealth of experience from lots of different use cases to really show like, hey, you know, the, the true mark of a wise person is, is learning from their own mistakes and learning from the mistakes of others. And that's what you're doing when you're hiring a consultant is you're, you're taking all that learned experience with that platform and with different customers and bringing it into the organization. And that's why, you know, we, you know, obviously we're biased, but why we feel consultants are worth their weight in gold because they're going to they're gonna set you up to start the project off right to begin with. Um, it's going to be correct from the get-go to help return and re recoup that ROI that you're hoping to do. They're going to help you maximize your existing toolkit. You know, when system A plugs into system B, where's that synergy? So instead of just one plus one, you're getting, you know, three out, out of that equation. We, we as consultants help train your team. So they not only understand how to use the tool, but how to use it the most effective way possible. And then lastly, this is sometimes overlooked, but while your internal team can do this, you know, you're, you're diverting resources that are scarce in a lot of cases from a technology perspective away from working on systems and technologies that impact your competitive advantage as a business um, to put them into a you know marketing platform, which again is important. And, you know, we're, we're in that space, but it's diverting resources that could potentially be better spent by you sure. and bringing a, a consultant in allows you to keep, let those resources keep doing what they're doing while also allowing your marketing team to move forward. Oh, great answer. Thanks, Brandon. Um, Devin, for you, uh, just kind of jumping around on the questions here. We frequently hear from clients and prospects uh, on how difficult it is to manage revenue analytics. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you see this evolving and what should leaders uh, be doing today to try to get their revenue analytics in line? Uh, and, that, and that'll conclude our, our day of uh, questions. Uh, we'll wrap up after that. Yeah, absolutely. So revenue analytics are only as good as the data in them. I think uh, Allison- I'm sensing a theme with you on the data. Yes. <laughs> But it's true. It's true. You have to have clean, good data in those tools to make recommendations and prove your own spin. If, if the data isn't clean, it's not going to be able to do that for you. So not only is it important that it's clean, you need to be pulling data from every tool again that collects behavioral data for your customers. Because while you're trying to analyze what they do, you can't accurately assess your ROI on spend without that full picture. Then I think what we can start looking to in the future too, Allison made a great point about Adobe Sensei, this layer of artificial intelligence, being able to provide sort of predictive analytics and predictive insights into how your data is behaving, along with having that human touch there to be able to make sure that you're collecting everything that you possibly could that could have touched your revenue in some way and making sure that the data that gets there is clean. So you want to be working toward a fully integrated ecosystem. And if we're looking into the future in the next few years, I would start looking at AI layers for your revenue analytics tools. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, any closing thoughts from the team uh, on today's conversation uh, as we kind of conclude and wrap things up? I thought this was great. Um, I'll throw that in there. I think we've made um, a pretty strong argument for how the platforms can all work together, how important it is to have that clean data and what steps marketers can take now to improve the quality of that data and to better empower them to personalize these messages while staying compliant and all of the concerns that face marketers. But I'm always available, as I'm sure this whole team is, if anyone has additional questions or if it sparked some sort of insight that you'd want to discuss further. Well, speaking of automation, one of the uh, things that, uh, of course, we embrace is uh, marketing automation as well, right? So um, all of our attendees can expect to receive a, a thank you from us, along with some contact information on how to get more information if you're interested in, in the products we've discussed today, uh, specifically uh, uh, Adobe and, and Marketo and Visible, uh, as well as Vertify data. Um, your integration platform is a service tool uh, there. Um, and then if you have questions in and around uh, strategy and uh, incorporating all of this into your tech stack and um, you know, really uh, defining what success can look like in your organization, Xeris is gonna be your leader in that space. So we'd love to uh, engage with you further. 
Um, and as I stated early on in the conversation, uh, that workshop uh, in the files that we had shared, uh, please download that if you're interested in Marketo and we'll work with you uh, and waive the cost of that workshop. So um, those are my last words. Brandon and Allison, did you have anything else to uh, chime in on before we uh, let our attendees go for the afternoon? This was great. Thank you, everybody. I will talk about anything marketing related all day, whenever. We just want to chit chat. <laughs> I love this stuff. Thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah, and I, I'd like to echo that. So it was, it was a pleasure being on the panel with uh, both of you. And then Ed, thanks for doing a great job moderating. Uh, I just wanted to say a thank you to all the, the viewers here. So it, it's tough to get away. I, I, I've been in your shoes. I understand that. Um, I think marketers that set themselves apart are ones that are willing to go to sessions like these to hear from other things and really, you know, take time to take a step back and learn some things to be able to move three steps forward. So thank you for your time today. Like, like everyone said, we're happy to work with you guys and, and find a personalized solution that, that works for you. And, you know, can't wait to, you know, make that impact that we talked about earlier for your organization. Thank you very much. Uh, started on time and ending on time. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending our session, the Future of Marketing Automation Roundtable, um, and uh, we will see you on down the line. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.